Hello, magical, wonderful internet friends. I hope you're all doing well today. Uh, and welcome back to Water Child Tarot. My name is Sarah. And as promised, we're going to look at Minkiati decks today. Uh, now, Minkiati is a relative of, but not exactly the same as tarot. The main distinguishing feature of Minkiati decks is that they have extra cards. So there are typically 97 cards in a Minkiati deck as opposed to the modern standard of 78 for tarot. Um, they are, however, very similar in the cards that they share, uh, with one exception, and we'll get to that in a minute. I want to go over the decks that we're going to look at today. I'll give you a little bit about Minkiati history, what little I know. I'm really not an expert, but I am interested in learning. And um, I will put some links to Marilyn of Tarot Clarity's uh, Minkiati videos below if you want to see someone else talk about Minkiati. Um, and then we're going to do a complete walkthrough, and I won't linger too long on the cards, and I'll try not to blab too much. Um, but I do want to point out some similarities and differences in these decks um, between this game and then the game of Tarot. And speaking of games, I will read you a little bit on the history of Minkiati from this um, pamphlet that comes with the Minkiati al Signo from Bologna of 1775. Um, this deck is uh, a reproduction published by Los Carabeo, and it's the center deck here. Um, I'm going to be comparing this one with an Il Minogallo uh, reproduction of the Minkiati Etruria. And you'll see that they have very different um, art mediums used and therefore different styles. And then on the left, we actually have a faux Minkiati. Um, this is the Taro Rosenwald or Taroki Rosenwald um, that is a reproduction uh, redrawn and colored by Heather Hall. And um, this is not a Minkiati originally, but Heather uh, released a pack of additional cards that sort of transforms it into a Minkiati. Um, again, with that one exception, which we'll talk about in a minute. But first, I want to start off with some history. Um, so this little booklet uh, that came with the uh, Minkiati al Signo is quite good, and I'm just going to read you the couple of pages. And just know that there is uh, adult content in, in this um, description. Okay, so it says the term Minchiati is in the Italian language would be seen as a vulgar expression similar to bullshit, providing a negative judgment on something with connotations of stupidity, senselessness, or insignificance. In common usage, the word minchia is actually a colloquial term for penis. In the field of playing cards, however, the term Minkiati refers to a card game and the deck used to play it, a variant of the tarot deck expanded to 97 cards. Historians, however, believe that there is a connection between the two meanings. The generally accepted hypothesis is that those who had attributed this term to the game had done so with the intention of belittling it. One of the first references to Minkiati appeared in a short poem written in about 1510 by the poet from Pisano, Venturino Venturini, in which he summarized the meaning of the term as, quote, something foolish. The same poet pointed out the connection between Minkiati and the game of tarot. In the same period, the term tarot sometimes acquired a similar derogatory meaning. Evidence of this can be seen in the words written in 1525 by the Roman poet Francesco Berni. The 16th century Italian may be translated like this. He really is tarot-faced, one who likes the game with its connotations of stupid, silly, idiotic, worthy of being in the company of bakers, cobblers, and down-and-outs, playing tarot, trumps, or minchiati. This attitude towards tarot cards seems strange and was perhaps due to a kind of prejudice against the poorer social classes. The game of tarot was gaining popularity among them after being the prerogative of the rich and noble in the previous century. The rules of both games, tarot and minkiati, were complicated. They required attention and strategy, which is why these cards were not subject to the legal restrictions of other gambling games based purely on good or bad luck. The Minkiati game, and therefore its deck, developed from the second half of the 15th century through the elaboration of a normal tarot deck. The high priestess was eliminated while prudence, the three theological virtues, the four elements, and the twelve signs of the zodiac were added. And that is how the deck reached 97 cards. And I will point out that the high priestess was not typically called the high priestess, she was called the Papas. Los Garibea's uh, booklet continues. 
This game spread from its birthplace, Florence, to Rome, Bologna, and even to German countries thanks to the traffic and trade associated with the ties of kinship between the Medici and the imperial family. The commercial success of the Minchiati, originally produced only in Florence, led card makers in Bologna to start manufacturing them. This Minchiati deck comes precisely from Bologna. It was printed using a wood block process, and after drying, it was painted with stencils by young boys, as was customary in the past, when manual work was an integral part of every craft production. To give greater strength to the cards, other more experienced boys glued a wood block printed sheet on the back of each and turned a small flap on the front. On the back of the deck is the Al Signo mark. You can see that here clearly visible and identifies both the manufacturer and the period of production. The Al Signo workshop actually belonged to Pellegrino Torri, a card maker operating in Bologna between 1759 and 1797. Further confirmation is provided by the iconography of the deck. In fact, if you look carefully at the angel card, you can see the outline of the buildings and famous towers of Bologna. So that is Los Carabeos' little history lesson. Again, I have not uh, had the time or the resources to fact check this completely. So if there is misinformation, I will simply blame my original source. Um, I would like to do some more historical looking into Minchiati, um, but I don't know when exactly that's going to happen. So for now, I'm just sharing what I, what I have and what I do know. I will briefly show you the packaging of these decks just so you can uh, recognize them. So the Etruria deck here on the right comes in a box like this. It is from Il Minigello, and it has what I think is a wrong date on the end here. So this is 1725. I think this should say 1805 or 1807 to uh, match up with the little information um, slip of paper that they include in here. The Etruria um, fiefdom or kingdom, whatever you want to call it, um, was active in the early part of the 1800s, not the 1700s. So I think this is a misprinted date. Um, but otherwise, it's a very nice deck, and it's a nice reproduction. Again, we have this Al Signo, which is um, the booklet that I was reading from, and this is, again, from Bologna. We'll see that this has um, a lot of characteristics of other Bolognese uh, tarots, and um, that's what the box looks like. This is part of the um, Los Carabeo um, Anima Antiqua um, series, and it is a limited edition of 3,999 copies. Now that might not sound like a limited edition, but for them it is, and these do sell out, um, these Anima Antiqua series. So if you want to get one, I would keep an eye on like the Llewellyn sales, um, and if you're in North America, they're the distributor of Los Carabeo. Um, you might have other distributors in Europe, and you know, keep an eye out for sales and then go ahead and get one if you're um, interested because it's a pretty good deal. Um, especially compared to Il Milanigello decks, which tend to be more expensive. Um, the Heather Hall deck, again, is not um, a Minchiati, but it I have, I have the extra expansion pack for it. Um, it does not come in any kind of case, but I made a little two-part box for it. This is my handmade um, box made out of office folder material, and I do have two tutorial videos on my channel if you want to figure out how to make your own boxes. So let's get into this, and I will just point out some similarities and differences as we get to those cards, but um, when we get to like the pip cards and things where there's not much to talk about, I'll try to go quickly so that we're not here for two hours looking at these. Um, these are the backs. Again, we have the Heather Hall, the El Signo, and the Etruria here. And the Heather Hall deck does not come with a title card. It just comes with the 90, uh, 98 if you get the expansion pack. The El Signo comes with a, uh, a numbered card, so you, you know which deck of the 4,000 you, you're getting. And it also comes with this one, which is just the same on front and back. And then the Etruria deck comes again with a numbered. This was number 861 out of 2,000 of this particular run, which I think is a fifth or sixth printing, but I'm not 100% sure. They don't tell you here. Um, usually, El Minigello will tell you on this um, you know, it'll say Edizioni, uh, uh, and then it'll give you the number, so which edition it is, but this one doesn't. Um, so if you know, uh, just from looking at this card, um, let me know. I'd love to know which printing this is. Here are full cards, and you can see right away the difference in art style. Um, now Heather Hall redrew, um, and actually had to make up a fool. Um, this deck 
the original line artwork uh, that was recovered out of book bindings um, did not include a fool card. And so there's some debate as to whether the fool uh, even existed. Um, but the reproductions that I've seen, um, the artists do create a fool card just to be complete. Um, so this is her interpretation of what the fool might have looked like. Um, in the center we have the Alcigno, and over here we have the Etruria, and you'll see that the Alcigno and the Etruria are very similar in a lot of their depictions, even though the art style is different. So here we have a wood, blo wood block and stencil, a wood block and stencil, and then this is actually engraved. And of course engraving gives us much finer detail. You can see the leaves on the bushes and the cross hatching on uh, the, this leg here to show shadow and the difference in light. Um, but you get the idea. So this is a more maybe traditional or Marseille style fool that we might see. And then in these two, he's actually entertaining uh, children or perhaps being, um, you know, attacked by them or something like that. And they might be uh, making fun of him or harassing him as he's trying to make his way uh, from place to place. Here we have our magician, and again, we have a more a traditional looking magician here in the Heather Hall deck or the um, Rosenwald what you might call a Marseille style magician, although this predates Marseille and it's Italian, so it's not Marseille. Uh, none of these are Marseille decks. Um, but here and here we have a magician who's again entertaining children or people. Um, so we have two audience members looking on here and then we have uh, two young boys or children uh, looking on here and the magician looks like he might be, you know, trying to like distract this one while he takes this cup or something like that. And the numbering in these decks varies. So a Minkiati does not use the same order of numbering as we're used to in tarot. So you'll see the numbers kind of jumping around. Uh, I've done my best to put the Heather Hall deck to match the imagery for the Minkiati. So it'll look kind of out of order. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that the number two card, uh, two, three, and four are the um, society elders or the, or the rich and powerful. Um, in a Minkiati deck. So we don't get a high priestess, um, we get a series of emperors here. Although this card does look feminine, um, this person has breasts and long hair, so I would read them as a female. Um, and I am going to use male and female uh, pronouns as we go through here just to keep it clear and straightforward. Um, you know, not that um, drag and other forms of gender fluidity didn't exist at this time. It, it, certainly did. Um, Shakespeare writes about it and, and we see it in other literature of the time. I, I'm not sure that that was the intention uh, here. I don't know really what the intention was. Um, even this emperor who seems to have a more muscly body has a, a rather feminine face and long hair. So who knows what that's exactly meant to represent. Uh, but in other Minkietti decks you'll just see three male presenting figures in a row here. So here we have the number three and this is another emperor here, so it's like the emperor of the east, the emperor of the west, and um, something else. And they were politically changing this up so as to not um, get into political trouble between having um, popes versus emperors in the same deck. That's my understanding. So, and then we have the emperors here. So again, this deck has four cards where these would have three. You'd have three emperors in a Minkiati, and you would have the traditional um, Emperor, Empress, and Pope and Popess in a, in a tarot or a, an early Italian tarot deck. And then again, this is the Pope, and then these are Emperors. Um, at position five, we have the Lover. Um, and you also notice that none of these decks have titles, so, but I'm going to use the singular for Lover because other decks, uh, other tarot decks of the time, um, use that language rather than lovers, and we only see one lover, right? We see a, a couple, we don't see three people. So the lover card or the love card or the matrimony card, depending on what you want to say about it. Here we have temperance. And you can see that these two decks, even though they are very different in terms of the way they're produced and the art style, they are very similar in terms of what they're depicting. Here is strength, all three with a column. Justice. This 
this is the Wheel of Fortune, and it's interesting how the Minkiati decks actually have the donkey at the top, as almost as if, you know, by the time that you get to the the top of the or the pinnacle of success, you're an ass, right? And then on your way down, you become more human. Whereas here we have the ass at the bottom, and then you're a king when you're on top of things. It's these funny little visual jokes that I just love about older decks because. People take tarot and, you know, history in general very seriously, but these people had a sense of humor, and they certainly had a sense of political humor as well, so I really like this. I also like um, chariots from different angles, so here you have this guy being pulled by two, I don't know, Shetland ponies or something, they're little tiny horses. Um, this almost looks like a Bacchus figure, uh, you know, he's um, just has a loincloth on and he's He's on this chariot as if he's in a parade. And then here we have a nude female driving her chariot. So very interesting and different. Here we have Hermit or Father Time. I learned recently that the stag is here to represent age as well as uh, the older uh, gentleman with the infirm body. Um, the stag having grown very large horns. So a stag would have to be quite old to have horns like that. The Hanged Man or the Traitor, and again depicted with some sort of valuables, sacks of gold or money, or some people interpreted this as uh, Judas. I'm not sure historically um, what that would have represented, or just being a traitor in general. Here's Death. And the Devil. This one reminds me of other um, Belgian decks, this devil in the middle. We have the tower, or as it's sometimes labeled in other decks that, that show this kind of depiction, this would be the house of God. And here you have a woman trying to escape and then someone either running after her or perhaps trying to grab her and pull her back into the burning buildings when we're not sure. So I believe this is Hope. We're getting into the extra Minkiati cards. This would be Prudence. Prudence always depicted as looking at herself in the mirror and with a snake. This would be Faith, I think. And interestingly, here you have an old man instead of a woman. The virtues are usually depicted as female. And finally, charity. And there's some back and forth in the text as to what this is. Some people think it's a flame, and others interpret it as a shaft of wheat. Um, and I think possibly down through the ages, as different card makers were trying to copy older decks, it might have gotten... Uh, muddled a bit. Okay, and then Minkia Minkiati decks, in addition to having all seven of the virtues rather than just three, um, they also have the elements and the signs of the zodiac. Um, interestingly, the signs of the zodiac are not in any particular order that I can discern, so um, we'll see that as we go through. But here's fire, and we have something that looks perhaps like a salamander here. Here it looks like a goat or something, and I don't know what this creature is meant to be. We have a ship on the ocean for water, and here's a similarity. I don't know where Heather Hall got her inspiration, but perhaps from something like this with this animal on the top of the ship. Um, you can see men here in the ship, and then here you don't see um, any human figures, at least not that I can make out, but there is a whale down here, or dolphin or something. And here is the earth card. We have a tree in the middle with a river or a body of water running through, and then um, animals in the background of this one. There's no animals here, but sometimes there are animals in the earth card. And uh, I'll leave it to you to look at uh, Marilyn of Tarot Clarity's um, videos, which again, I'll link below, 
to um, listen to her thoughts on this earth card. And finally we have air and this is potentially a leopard or something. It's a spotted animal of some kind. Here we have, I don't know what, some kind of animal, and this could be a fox potentially. Um, but it's whatever that animal is, and then birds in the sky and stars in the sky to represent air. Next we have the zodiac sign of Libra. Um, I always love that the uh, the fox up here is balanced over a porcupine, and so if he doesn't stay balanced, what's going to happen is he's going to fall off and land on this sharp object and, you know, probably die. So that's uh, consequences of, I guess, not being fair. Here we have uh, Virgo. Scorpio. Aries, Capricorn, which is a sea goat. I see in some places it's just referred to as a goat, but it's actually meant to be a sea goat. So it has a tail and then a goat's head and four legs. Sagittarius. And in both of these Minkiati decks, you see him with a wild boar. So I guess he's a hunter, and then this is the game. We have Cancer. And here on the Atreya uh, card, this is an original uh, reproduction of the stamp, the tax stamp that would have been for this deck. Pisces is next. Aquarius, and if you'll notice, it's a person pouring out one or more uh, vessels. And again, Marilyn of Tarot Clarity has some thoughts about this card and how it may have morphed into what we think of as Tarot de Marseille. Here is Leo. And Taurus. Gemini, and so after that interlude of extra cards, we're back into the main part of the deck. Now you'll notice that on the previous cards we did have Roman numerals, but now these don't have numerals on them. So I can only imagine that from the star to the end of the pack, maybe these all had the same rank or point value, and so therefore you just knew that, and you knew that if you played star, moon, sun, the world or the angel card that those were all kind of the same value in the game of Minkiati. Anyway here's our star card and we don't see a naked lady pouring out two jugs of water we see a dude on a horse. Um, he's got a crown on and he's bearing something a cup a chalice something like that. For our moon card we get an astronomer he has this uh, some sort of measuring device here, and then that goes along with this to take measurements of the movement of the stars. And here we have the sun card, and I particularly like Minkiati's treatment of the sun card um, because you have a couple here uh, who are, you know, enjoying time outside, uh, perhaps an intimate moment uh, from what's going on in here, um, or just kind of hanging out. Um, and I, I love this imagery. I think it's very appropriate for the sun. You know, the sun is about like revealing. If you think about. Um, how it might come up in a reading, it's about revealing your true self, it's about being out in the open. And um, it makes me think of this card um, from this Fifth Spirit Tarot by Charlie Claire Burgess, which is a, a modern take really on the RWS, but here um, the artist has put in um, themselves with their partner and they're out having a picnic. Um, and so it, it reminded me, um, when I saw the sun card for the first time in the Minkiati, it reminded me of this um, kind of interpretation, uh, modern interpretation of this. And I really appreciate that. 
And next we have the world, and yes, this is the order it would have gone in. Somehow I think tarot got screwed up along the way. I really think the world card should come with the rest of the celestial uh, bodies rather than there being this weird interruption. Um, and it makes sense to me from a, um, you know, a, a Christian society um, where tarot was originally invented that the world would have come not quite at the end, but that the angel card or the heaven card or the resurrection card or whatever you want to call this card um, would have actually been the ultimate um, attainment. And so I, I wish that we could uh, now go back and, you know, renumber tarot slightly. I know that it would mess with people's ideas about certain things, but it just makes so much more sense to me to have this be the last card. If I were to ever design a tarot, what I would probably do is actually approach it like these decks and put no numbers and no titles on and just let people do whatever they wanted with um, the ordering of the majors. Um, all right, so now we're going to get into the minor suits. And you will see um, the difference between the Rosenwald and then how the um, pip cards are arranged in the two Minkiatis. Um, the Rosenwald sticks with a more French or Marseille style arrangement, um, and the Minkiatis kind of go off in their own direction So, um, and have extra little embellishments on them, which I rather like. Um, this calls to mind uh, Romulus and Remus, um, the founding of Rome with the twins um, suckling from a wolf. Four of Swords, we have a unicorn and a something else. Marmot, monkey, I have no idea what some of these animals are meant to be. Five of Swords, we have a fox in a hen house. It's certainly going to create some excitement and conflict. Six of Swords. I think this is meant to be some kind of feline below. And then up here we have a cockerel, maybe? Peacock, something? And then I don't know what this disco ball is up here. Um, again, if you know more about this than I do, please feel free to pipe up in the comments. I'd love to learn more. That's why we're all here. Here's our seven. Our eight. This looks like a hedgehog and a monkey. This looks like an I don't know what and a something else with big ears. Maybe a rabbit. Maybe an armadillo. <laughs> Did they have armadillos? Did they know about armadillos? I don't know. Our nine. And our Ten of Swords, and even between these two Minkiati decks, you can see there's some differences. This has two going down vertically, and this has one going down and then one across. Here we have our Page of Swords, and they're all masculine presenting, or male, and that is relevant in a minute. Now for our Knights, this is one of the reasons I wanted to compare the Rosenwald with the Minkiati. So the Rosenwald did originally have these kind of knights, and you'll notice that they're centaurs. They're half horse, half human. Um, and we get something similar here in these particular knights and the swords, half horse, half human. So keep that in mind as we move forward. Here are our queens of swords. And our kings. Moving on to the suit of wands, and these are in the order that the Minkiati decks arrived in, so I've kept that, assuming that that was somehow significant. Our two of wands, again we have extra animals and things in our Minkiati decks, so here we have a wolf and a, uh, what would that be, a heron or something? Um, and then a person up here. Three of wands, or bastone, they'd be batons, right, in Italian. Four. The five. Or six. Seven. The eight, nine, and ten. And these are all, well, no, yeah, these are all very similar. 
in their arrangement of that 10. So that's interesting. All right, and court cards. So in this suit as well, we have male pages or fante, as they would have been called. And it's interesting to me that the both the weapon suits have male pages. And again, we have half animal, half humans for our Knights of Wands. Um, in the hall deck, uh, the rest, the restored Rosenwald, we we always have horses as the bottom half of the animal. But in the Minkiati, it changes up. So here we have what looks like uh, the bottom half of a lion, and then a man on top. Here we have our Queen's Tibistani and our Kings. And this one looks older, and these two, this one looks younger to me, and this one guy looks older too. He's got wrinkly brow and a big bushy beard. On two cups, or even though I don't like it, what is sometimes referred to as one of the feminine suits. Um, but we'll see why, perhaps, in just a minute. So, cups, or copa. I like the different kinds of cups here. And again, different kinds of embellishments. Here's our monkey with the mirror again. We saw him in the um, Prudence card, and he's back. And for a second, I thought this was the Five of Cups, but it's not. It's an embellishment, and then Four Cups. So this is the Four of Cups as well. Here's our Five. Six. Seven. It's interesting to me that these differ in their arrangement. So there's no standardization. I mean, in this deck is probably 50 years younger than this one, and this one is about 200 years younger than these two. So you wouldn't expect standardization necessarily. That was the nine. And here's our 10. Again, this is the more French type of arrangement, and these two match up with each other. Now, looky here, we have lady cup bearers in our pages for this suit. For our knights, again, we have man body and bottom half of something. This is, again is a horse. Here we have, I think, a griffin or a dragon or something like that. It's got wings and then this swirling tail. Here are our queens of cups. And again, we have an older queen with gray hair here and then a, a younger queen here and a young queen here. And our kings of cups who all look older to me. And our final suit are coins or denarii. Um, you have all different coins here. I don't know if this face is an addition by Heather Hall or if that's the way it was, but I do know these two animals, which I think are a fox and a hare or a leopard and a hare, uh, were part of the original Rosenwald deck. Here you have just a heavily decorated, it almost looks like a charger or something, a big platter. And then here you have something that looks like a decorative commemorative coin um, with two people standing by a brick wall. Very plain coins. We have our traditional uh, Bolognese spots on the middle card. And I like how the coins on the right are all different. So as we look through the Etruria deck, you can see that each coin, uh, each face on each coin is a little bit different. We get our signature card here, and you'll have seen that Heather Hall signed a couple of her cards as well. Um, this is interesting. This, this four of coins with the elephant in the middle, I think Robert Place um, borrowed from that imagery for a few of his alchemical decks. We've got the five. 
10, 6. And I'm sure someone has gone through and identified these are like emperors and empresses and other, you know, famous political people. Um, but I don't know who they are. This is interesting. This nine of coins has birds on all the coins, and I hadn't noticed that before. And our ten of coins. And again, we have lady pages. So it's interesting to me that um, there's so much um, similarity and overlap with the time difference um, between these three and I just wonder how that might play out if you were to do a, a big timeline of all decks known. Um, I'm not suggesting that any one deck influenced another because it's hard to know where the direct influences are um, and so many decks that were probably available back then we don't have existing copies of because you know paper uh, degrades over time, and I'm sure many decks that did exist are, are now lost. But just seeing these kinds of similarities is very interesting from a anthropological, cultural, uh, mythological kind of perspective. Here is our Queen of Coins. And our King. And to conclude, I just want to say thank you for um, watching this video on Historic Tarot with me. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I hope it was interesting and whether or not you learned something, maybe it piqued your interest to look into ancient Ita Italian decks in general or the game of uh, Minchiati. I uh, have a book on Minchiati that I'll be reviewing for you and we'll let you know about that later. Um, but until then, I want to say be well. Thanks again for watching. Um, let me know if you have any other good sources on Mickey Leave them in the comments below, and I'll see you next time. Bye!